een van harte goede dag. And to our foreign attendees and viewers, welcome. His Excellency President Chandrika Prasad Santoki, His Excellency Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guerres and team, His Excellency Minister of Foreign Affairs, International Business and International Cooperation, Albert Ramdin, foreign and local dignitaries, members of the, of the press, welcome. Borrowing this earth from generations to come obligates us to deliberate on matters regarding its mere existence. With this in mind, the climate was at the core of the meeting between the Secretary General and the Chair of CARICOM. In the week of this meeting, this press briefing is held and it will be conducted as following. At first, the Chair of CARICOM will state his opening remarks. Then, the Secretary General of the United Nations will have the floor. Afterwards, the members of the press will have the opportunity for questions to the head table. Without further ado, can I invite the Chair of the CARICOM to state his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Alphan, Master of Ceremony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, and his uh, staff members, ministers, and representative of the Peace Press. Uh, media. Welcome once again. This afternoon we had uh, the press conference with the Secretary General of uh, CARICOM and now we have the press conference with the Secretary General of the World Organization, the United Nations. And we as a country, we are having the honor to welcome the Secretary General of the United Nations in Suriname. As the first time that we as country are honored by the visit of the Secretary General of the United Nations. And we had a bilateral meeting and the Secretary General presented his view on Suriname, but particularly how he had heard about Suriname what he had heard about Suriname, the situation of Suriname, the location of Suriname, the challenges of my country. But when he arrived here, he was faced with the reality. And he said it from his heart. And I felt it as president of my beautiful country that he was touched. And he will explain himself what his experience is by this visit in Suriname. But we as people of Suriname, we are proud that we have that leader of the world over here. His presence is giving us once again the indication that we as government are growing and getting more confident in the world and getting more trust. And that we have discussed also where, where we stand in now as country, as regards our financial crisis, as regards our debt crisis, but also other crises. What we have in the world, the war in Ukraine and the impact on oil and gas, the impact on food prices, the climate change crisis with a lot of impact in my country with a lot of heavy rainfalls, the flooded area, but also our low-lying coastal area, which is threatened by the rising of the ocean waters. And very humbly, the Secretary General asked me, President, I feel your beautiful country. I'm seeing your challenge. Tell me what I can do. <laughs> and I presented some of the requests, what we're discussing for many years in our country, on the impact of the climate change, but also our status in the vulnerability index, 
which is positioning us as country, as a middle income country, which is hampering my country to get concessional loans and getting access to cheap capital. And he gave me the guarantee and he instructed his staff to look at those cases and to look what the United Nations can do. And therefore, I'm presenting on behalf of my government, on behalf of my people, my sincere gratitude to you, Secretary General. Secretary General, you have the floor. Mr. President, uh, honorable ministers, distinguished members of the media, good evening. I'm very pleased to visit Suriname for the first time and this is a visit of friendship and solidarity. And I thank President Santoki and the people of Suriname for your warm welcome. Suriname is one of the greenest, if not the greenest, country on the planet. It is one of the few carbon negative countries and it is a leader in biodiversity protection. But unfortunately, Suriname stands out because it is such an exception. Around the world, we are seeing the failure of climate leadership and the proliferation of disastrous climate disruption. Our world is still moving in the wrong direction. The science is clear. To meet the goal of limiting temperature rise by 1.5 degrees, global emissions must decline by 45% by 2030. Yet, the current national climate pledges around the world result in an increase in emissions of 14% by 2030. This is suicide. With every passing hour of climate dithering, the pulse of the 1.5 degree goal gets weaker and weaker. And big emitters have a particular responsibility. Let's not forget that G20 countries represent 80% of global emissions. On the other hand, Caribbean nations are on the front lines of the climate crisis and have consistently shown steadfast leadership. I saw that leadership in action during my visit to the rainforest today. About 93% of Suriname is covered by rainforests. You are committed to keeping it that way. Rainforests are a precious gift to humanity. And that is why from here in Suriname, I want to send a message to the world. We must honor and preserve the gift of rainforests. Because this is not a gift that we'll keep on giving. If we keep seeing the scale of destruction across the world's rainforests, we are not just biting the hand that feeds us, we are tearing it to shreds. The equation is simple. If we protect the rainforests, they protect us. If we destroy the rainforests, we destroy ourselves. What I have seen here in Suriname gives me hope and inspiration. But what are, we are seeing around the world is cause for deep shock and anger. Rampant deforestation and worsening climate impacts are increasing forest fires and drought. This is outrageous and shameful. It is a global suicide in slow motion. Destruction in rainforest systems around the world must be a global wake-up call to save the lungs of our planet. And Suriname, must be an example that all others follow. Today I met indigenous peoples, representatives who are showing the way. Indigenous peoples have not contributed to climate change, yet they are among the most affected worldwide. At the same time, they have solutions that the world can learn so much from. They are proud guardians of some of the planet's indispensable biological diversity and they need support to do so. I also saw firsthand how Suriname is working to monitor and preserve essential mangrove systems which are threatened by sea level rise and coastal erosion. Nature-based solutions such as preserving and developing mangroves, rainforests and other essential ecosystems are vital. The world needs more 
such initiatives. Across all these fronts, it is critical that nations, especially the wealthiest, work together to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees and to build resilience to the climate shocks to come. That means finally making good on the long-standing pledge to provide developing countries with 100 billion US dollars a year for climate action. Finding equitable solutions to the debt crisis that is crushing many countries in the region. Increasing and facilitating access to concessional funding for small island developing states and other middle income countries, in particular for adaptation. And indeed, what I've seen in Suriname is that this country is extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and the world has the obligation to massively invest in support of Suriname's program of adaptation as Suriname is providing the world with the gift of rainforests that allow it to be a carbon negative country. And we seriously need to address loss and damage and supercharge a renewable energy revolution. As I saw today, we have the tools and the know-how. Our world needs the political will and solidarity to make the difference that is needed. Suriname and the Caribbean region are leading the path forward. We must follow that lead for people, for prosperity, and for the planet. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Members of the press, you now have the opportunity for questions. Who can I give the floor for the first question? Mr. Cairo. Good evening, all. Um, I have one question for Mr. Gutierrez. Um, you just mentioned uh, the, the role Suriname plays in, in keeping its forest as it is. Uh, and for many years, as the president just stated, that uh, small island states and small states are calling on international community for accessible and concessional uh, uh, financing. Why has this call not led yet to, to tangible solutions? And since you have seen what is happening in Suriname now, what are the mechanisms that you as US, UNSG have to be a turning uh, in, this, in this development that the small states don't have access to, to those kind of financing that you just mentioned? Thank you. Well, we have been uh, strongly advocating for a reform of the global financial system. Our global financial system was defined after the Second World War by the rich countries of the time Many were not yet independent. Suriname was not at the table. Most African countries were not at the table. So the system was designed by the rich to the rich. And so we have a number of uh, uh, inconsistencies in the system. First, middle income countries are denied concessional funding. But middle-income countries can be very vulnerable to external shocks, debt shocks, climate shocks, shocks in the global markets of food and energy. And the fact that they have middle income doesn't solve the problem because they will become low-income countries if they are not supported in those shocks. Look at uh, uh, several of the neighbors that were um, uh, affected by COVID, tourist-based uh, island states all of a sudden lost all tourists. So they are middle-income countries, but the income was not coming. And um, uh, many situations like these are happening around the world. One of the very strong positions we have in relation to the IMF, and I think that for the first time in the new resilience fund, this is recognized. We need to have concessional funding for middle income countries facing external shocks, because that is absolutely essential to preserve their status and to protect their population, especially the most vulnerable. And uh, another thing that many people do not know, the largest number of poor people in the world are not in the poorest countries, are in middle income countries. 
which is another reason why it is important to support those countries. We have been insisting since the food and the energy and finance crisis that was amplified by the Ukrainian war, we have been insisting on the need for the IMF to mobilize all the emergency funding, the need for end the penalties when countries borrow above the quota, and now there are penalties and they, they should be abolished, uh, the need for the World Bank and the other international financial institutions to provide much more concessional funding, especially in relation to climate adaptation. And uh, this is something that, of course, is extremely important to Suriname. And uh, that we need the framework that was defined in relation uh, by the G20 in relation to debt relief, including middle-income countries, to work. Now, I have to say that the government of Suriname has developed a huge uh, initiative in order to obtain um, a solution of, uh, at, for the moment, uh, the Club of Paris uh, in its debt problem. Uh, but you still have to deal now with the private creditors. Um, the framework that was defined by the G20 simply doesn't work. Only three countries were candidates, none has received anything. So we need an effective framework for debt relief of middle-income countries, and this is something that we go on strongly advocating for. So we need to transform a global financial system that doesn't work for developing countries and middle-income countries into a global financial system whose main objective is to contribute to reduce inequalities in the world. Thank you. Next question, please. I saw you attempting. Yes. Good evening. Uh, Vishani Raghavar from the newsroom in Guyana. Uh, both leaders, you acknowledge that there are significant financial needs for climate adaptation and mitigation. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, what is your position on Guyana and Suriname using their newfound oil wealth to fund those needs? Well, it is my belief that uh, today uh, the reserves and oil and gas that exist will never be entirely consumed. So obviously I'm not a supporter, uh, enthusiastic supporter of oil and gas projects. But I've been prime minister of my country and uh, I can imagine the prime minister of Suriname looking into the resources of his country and I think uh, we need to understand that uh, it is difficult to look into Saudi Arabia or the Emirates and to think that uh, their oil is different from yours. Having said so, I would recommend maximum restraint and maximum care in the way to handle that problem. Thank you. Next question, please. Yes, Mr. Kayo. Uh, Mr. President, you just mentioned that you have put forward proposals uh, or suggestions to Mr. Guterres regarding the, the problem that Suriname faces uh, within the sphere of climate change. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Kayo. The, uh, the Secretary General had uh, impressed me on his uh, touch when he said that uh, he had some observation and some trips uh, in the interior. He observed the forest coverage of our country. He went to some Amar Indian villages. But when he saw the coastal line, and when he saw the ocean, and how close the coastal line and the entire coastal area with the living community 
was from that ocean and he was really scared what was the challenge of our country. And that is the importance of such a visit. Because uh, in reports, we can describe the challenges, the threats, but when you're here in Suriname, and that is what I've uh, experienced uh, with, with the feeling of the SG that he was, his heart was touched. And that is what he expressed also fun of President, you tell me what I can do. And that was the same discussion what we had with the media during the press conference with the SG from CARICOM. When I informed the media that the world had designed strategies already to control the impact of the global warming, the climate change, and there are mechanisms designed already. And one is, as world, as nations, to take the adaptation measure, and that we need to design that adaptation strategy as country. And the other hand is that mitigation strategy. And I told also the Secretary General that our position as country confronted with the financial crisis, the debt crisis, but also the crisis from COVID, the crisis from the Ukraine war, but also the crisis uh, from the climate change and the impact of all these crises towards our community and society. With a huge territory of more than 165,000 square kilometer on surface land territory and the same amount of territory in the economic maritime zone and that that entire impact of the crisis and also our territory should be protected by approximately 600,000 people. And that's very difficult. And there we, I presented him some of the ideas what we have, and that is that there must be a fund for that adaptation program but also a fund which can be utilized for funding the, the loss and the damage. Take, for example, our country, Suriname, where a big part of our interior, but also in the coastal area, are flooded. The villages are empty. All the people left their villages, and slowly they'll come back. And as you, when I visited one of some of the villages in the tribal area of the Matawai, I saw in large villages only 10 people, 15 people. And on my question, where are, where are these villagers? And their answer was, I don't know if they will come back because they are facing such a threat every year. They are investing in their livelihood. They are planting on their land. But every year, the flood is coming. So you see what is happening. And this is the challenge what we have as world, as nation, as government, to take the adaptation measure. And that is very costly. So uh, the SG uh, understood the message. And he said, uh, this is one of the issues we will discuss within uh, the United Nations system, and he instructed his staff already to uh, look for scenarios to come with a proper solution, particularly towards Suriname. And the other issue was uh, what uh, the SG had said uh, already, to have a redefinition on this, the status of countries, uh, particularly Suriname, which have the status of uh, middle-income countries, which is hampering us to uh, get access to cheap uh, capital. And that is one of the issues which should be uh, discussed, uh, SG. The, the G20 meeting uh, will be held in, in November. 
uh, I think, and uh, I will attend that meeting uh, also. Uh, so uh, hopefully on that meet meeting we can put on agenda the, the start of the, of the discussion for, for the redefining, re you know, the, the status of uh, low income, medium income and high income uh, countries, which will benefit a lot of small nations, a lot of developing countries to get access uh, to concessional loans. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. That brings us to the conclusion of this press conference. I'm looking at the press and I'm uh, going to inform you that we're going to take one final picture. So can I have the head table? Um, if we have some assistance here up front, then I want to ask the head table to stand um, right in front of the chairs and then we can take one more good picture for the press.